Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us, and welcome to the Astro 3D ECL Astronomers in Australia seminar series. My name is Yifei Jin. I'm a PhD student at the, the Australian National University. Before we begin, it's important for us to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were Australia's first astronomers that will acknowledge their long-standing systems of knowledge on which we continue to build. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the unceded lands on which we are meeting today. I am speaking with you today from the land of Nunawa and Nambri country. Our first speaker, Brian Rakati Chu, is speaking to you from Wurujuri people of Kulin Nation. And our second speaker, Junior Santusi, is speaking from the land of Badigo people. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all first people joining us here today. So why are we here? This series is facilitated by Astro3D, the ARC Center of Excellence for All Sky Astrophysics in Three Dimensions, COVID-19, has affected our ability to travel and present uh, at international seminars this year, especially for us in Australia. The time zones mean that often meetings take place at two or three in the morning. This lack of opportunity to network could disadvantage junior astronomers when entering the job market. This series aims to combat these issues by providing a platform for junior Australian astronomers to present their work to the world. There will be two talks over the hour. Each will be 20 minutes in length with five minutes for questions at the end of each talk. Please save your questions until the end of each talk. Feel free to use the chat function to ask your question if you prefer, and I can read it out for you. These talks are being recorded and will be placed afterwards on the Astro3D YouTube channel for educational and scientific purpose. By being here today, we are agreeing to abide by Astro3D's meeting code of conduct. I've already warned the speakers of this, but because of the limitations of Zoom, I will need to interrupt with five minutes to go in each talk. And our next speaker is Junior. She is from the University of New South Wales. And Junior, the screen is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, bro. Um, so hi, everyone. Thank you for being here today and waking up early for people in Australia. Uh, my name is Julia, and I'm a third year PhD student at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, working with, with Sarah Braff. So today we heard about star-forming galaxies, and now I'm going completely the other way, talking about passive galaxies, so galaxies that are, uh, haven't had any recent um, star formation. So in particular, I'm going to focus on my most recent PhD project um, that was focused on reconstructing the internal mass distributions and internal orbital structures of SAMI passive galaxies using Sparshield orbit superposition models. Now, before going into that, let me just give you a bit of background to tell you why we want to do this, and, and then we'll go into the results. So, sorry. So, um, our current understanding of galaxy formation suggests that galaxies form in a two phase process. During the first phase, before redshift two, galaxies become more massive by forming stars in situ, so in the inner regions. After redshift about two, uh, the outer regions start to assemble by accreting ex situ stars, so stars that were formed in external galaxies through mergers with other galaxies and galaxy interactions. So evidence of this formation scenario are predicted to be preserved in the stellar population radial profiles and in the 2D kinematics of local galaxies. So in particular for this project, I've been focusing on the 2D kinematics, applying spatial models in order to reproduce the internal structure of galaxies and better understand how they form and evolve. This is because the merger history of a galaxy is thought to be one of the major factors that determines its internal kinematic structure. So let's have a look at what spatial shield models are. Spatial models are dynamical orbit based models that allow orbital kinematic substructures in galaxies to be revealed. Now, this explanation is going to be very, very simplified. Uh, there's, there's a lot going on in those models, and I'm very happy to explain this in more details if anyone is interested. 
But for now, what you need to know is that we need two main ingredients. Um, the first ingredient is an image of the galaxy, for example, in the R band. And then we also need stellar kinematic maps derived from spectroscopic observations, something like uh, these ones here. So we, uh, because we need the spatial information as well, not just, so not just one spectrum from a galaxy, but information on um, different, uh, so the different kinematics in different regions of the galaxy. And the great thing about spatial models is that they will include all kinematic information. So also taking H3 and H4, the higher moments, not just velocity and velocity dispersion. So once we have these two ingredients, we can start creating our models. First of all, we need to create a suitable model for the underlying gravitational potential. And we do this by using um, a combination of three components. We need a stellar component, a dark matter component, and a central supermassive black hole. Once, uh, and this is where we need the image of the galaxy because the image is used to derive the intrinsic stellar luminosity density that is then converted into a stellar mass distribution. So once we have that, we can then start calculating a representative library of orbits using the gravitational potential that we just modeled. So uh, we do that with numerical integration. So we start, for example, from a single orbit, we integrate that for a sufficiently long time so that the density of the orbit converges to a fixed distribution. We have for our models, four main type of orbits that are being used. Um, a typical set of short axis orbits. So uh, orbits that are around the short axis, and then long axis tubes and a set of box orbits and a counter rotating set. Once we have all these orbits um, in the library, then we can um, start reproducing the observable. So what the model, what spatial model does is it fits the model to the observation by weighting the contribution of the different orbits. So we try to reproduce uh, the observable and we compare them to the observation using a chi-square comparison. Once the best fit model is found, we can then start to determine the internal structure of the galaxy. So this is, this is an example of uh, an observation and the best fit model for this observation. This was an average galaxy in our sample. So not the best one, not the worst, worst one, but just you know what we usually can get. And uh, so we have the observation maps in the first row and the model maps in the bottom row. Um, first column is luminosity density. Then we have line of sight velocity and velocity dis dispersion H3 and H4. As you can see, the model reproduces the maps quite well. They're not perfect, but they're actually pretty good. And so once we have this best fit model, we can start deriving information on the internal structure of the galaxy. And some of the properties that we can derive are, for example, the intrinsic shape of a galaxy. So not just the projected shape that we see, but the actual real shape of the galaxy. Well, at least an indication of what that could be. And then we can have information on the internal mass distribution. So the total cell, sorry, the total mass profile, stellar mass profile, and dark matter profile. We can also divide the galaxy into different orbital components. And for our sample, we decided to derive to divide the galaxies into four components. And these are a whole component that is dominated by strong rotation. So with lots of um, circular orbits. And then a hot component that is dominated by random motion, so pressure, su pressure supported with radial orbits and box, or box orbits, and a warm component that is something in between these two. So we have weak rotation. It's not the strong rotation that we can see, for example, in thin disks, but something more like a warm, uh, sorry, a thick disk. And then a counter rotating component uh, that is similar to the cold and warm component, but just rotating on the other direction. So we applied these models to a sample of galaxies from the SAMI Galaxy Survey. SAMI Galaxy Survey is an optical integral field spectroscopic survey of about 3,000 galaxies in the local universe. And as I was saying before, we need the special information. So SAMI, since it's an integral field spectroscopic survey, has for each galaxy, not just on a 
sorry, not just an image or a spectrum, but a 3D data cube. So for each pixel, we can actually get a spectrum. So uh, from this initial sample of 3000 galaxies, we selected uh, 124 passive galaxies that met our selection criteria. These galaxies have mass, stellar masses between 10 to the 9.6 and uh, 10 to the 11.3. And they range uh, different environments going from field, um, field galaxies, group galaxies, and cluster galaxies. For all of these galaxies, we derive the in inner properties, um, the in internal structures in within the inner regions. So we did this within one RE, with RE being the effective radius, so the radius within where we have half of the light from the galaxy. So let's have a look at the results that we got. Um, first of all, for the shapes. So what we found was that uh, the majority of our galaxies, at least the galaxies in our sample uh, are oblate. Um, we found 83% of them. None of them is prolate and 17% of them are triaxial. Now, this is quite interesting because we know the system, systems that are rotationally supported are likely axis symmetrics, symmetric, so um, they have rotation around the short axis, so they're oblate. But systems that are supported by velocity dispersion do not have to be axis symmetric, so they can be um, triaxial, for example. So we expect these triaxial systems to be mostly supported by random motions instead of um, just rotation. Okay, now if we have a look at the distribution of the shapes with stellar mass, this is interesting as well. Um, so we divided the main plot into three different sections according to the triaxiality parameter. And this is defined by using a P and Q, and P and Q are the ratios of the axis um, for the shape of the galaxy, for the ellipsoids. And so we have that, as I was saying before, the majority of the galaxies are oblate, but when we look at how uh, the fraction of uh, triaxial galaxies changes with uh, stellar mass, we can see the fraction um, in the top panel. We find that, especially when we go to mass above 10 to the 10.75, we have a high fraction, a higher fraction of triaxial galaxies reaching up to 25%. So that we see that high mass galaxies are more likely to be triaxial compared to um, low mass galaxies. Then, as I was saying before, another um, property that we can derive is the internal mass distribution. In particular, we have been focusing on the fraction of dark matter for, for our galaxies. And you can see here the fraction of dark matter for all the galaxies in our samples. And the um, bulk crosses are the median value for each mass bin, with the error bars um, representing the one sigma scatter around the median value. So there's a lot of scatter, but still we, um, we can still see the U shape that it's um, so familiar from literature where we have an increase in the fraction of dark matter, again, for masses um, above 10 to the 10.75. The, uh, the average value of uh, the fraction of dark matter that we see is uh, 0.25, so 25%, uh, that it's in agreement with literature results as well. So, well, we can um, get from this is the high mass galaxies have higher fractions of dark matter. Then, uh, as I was saying before, we also divided the galaxies into different components. And so here we show the orbital fraction of each component. So the red diamonds are uh, the hot components, so pressure supported, orange circles, warm orbits, they, are, um, they show weak rotation, blue triangle core orbits with strong rotation and the green squares are counter rotating orbits. Again, galaxies have been divided into five mass spins with the bold points um, being the median value of each uh, of the mass spins and the error bars representing the one sigma scatter around the median value. Now, again, we have some scatter, but we can definitely see this uh, trend with stellar mass. So we have that the odd component becomes more important with increasing stellar mass, while at the same time, the work component is decreasing. And they do start more or less at the same, uh, in the same range for lower mass galaxies. While for the counter-rotating component, 
we do not see any uh, difference, well, significant difference, uh, but we do see a slight decrease of the fraction of coal, uh, of the coal component with increasing stellar mass. So this is super interesting because from uh, simulations, we know the stars on different orbits are predicted to have had different formation paths. So we have that the coal components are mostly uh, are supposed to be mostly young stars formed in situ, while the warm component could trace all stars from in situ or stars being heated from cold disks via secular evolution, and also a small fraction of warm component could be accreted. But then the stars on hot orbits should be mostly accreted by minor or major mergers. So when we see that the fraction of hot orbits increases with increasing stellar mass, it means that we have those galaxies had experienced a higher number of mergers, while we have a decrease uh, of, in the fraction, of course, because yes, you lose some stars, but it's not like you could lose 40% uh, of the stars, but we have a decrease in the fraction of the warm orbits. So again, we have the high mass galaxies are supported by hot orbits. And this is still in agreement with what we've seen before, the galaxies uh, of higher masses they can be tri they are more likely to be triaxial, so they don't have to be rotationally supported. Um, so, in general, what we see was that we have a sudden change in trend uh, when we reach masses higher than ten to the ten point seventy five. So we have um, higher fraction of uh, galaxies with triaxial shapes compared to lower mass galaxies, and these galaxies also have higher fractions of dark matter. And they also have higher fractions of hot orbits. So these trends that we see and the change in these trends are in the inner, again, this is just in the inner regions of passive galaxies, so within 1RE. Um, but these trends are generally consistent with the formation paths of early type galaxies, or at least the theory um, behind one of the theories behind it. So According to this theory, slow rotating galaxies, so galaxies that are not rotationally supported but pressure supported, assemble near the center of massive dark matter halos via intense star formation at high redshift. Then their evolution is dominated by gas core mergers. So these galaxies are more likely to be triaxial and more massive, in agreement with what we find. And by comparison, fast rotating early type galaxies start as star forming disks and they evolve through a set of processes dominated by gas accretion and then they have bulge growth and quenching so this evolution can be seen um, in the internal orbital distributions that we uh, have and in the shape of the galaxies that we found so we have higher fraction of circular orbits so cold and warm orbits and flatter shapes nearly ax axis symmetric and so um, as my next step for this, um, I'll have I'll also analyze the environmental dependence for these galaxies. In particular, I'm gonna uh, compare the internal structures of central galaxies and satellite galaxies. So the galaxies that sit in the center of the group of the cluster compared to the other ones in the group and clusters. And in order to check whether there are differences in their evolution and formation history, and also see if the, whether there's a trend with local densities. I'm also including more galaxies in my sample because the primary sample, as I said before, was just 124 passive galaxies. So we're going to include active galaxies as well and check whether we have differences in structures for these galaxies or not. They would be really interesting to see. I am expecting, of course, to have uh, higher fractions of cold and warm orbits because those galaxies, um, active galaxies, in particular spiral galaxies, are more disk in shape, and so um, they're more likely to be cold, um, supported by cold orbits and a strong rotation. So just to summarize, um, we use partial models to derive the intrinsic properties of local passive galaxies in the SAMI galaxy survey. And what we found was that the most massive galaxies are more likely to have triaxial shapes compared to galaxies of lower mass, but also that more massive galaxies have higher fraction of dark matter and they're mostly pressure supported, reaching up to 80% um, of the contribution coming from the hot component. 
and they uh, and so they have a high fraction of all orbits. But for lower um, for galaxies of lower mass, we have um, warm orbits playing a, a very important contribution, and it's not just the cold orbits. While where we see that the contribution is up to 10, 20 percent. But again, these these are passive galaxies, so they're most uh, most of them are early type galaxies, and so we do not expect them to have a really strong disk. So all these properties uh, and their dependence on galaxy mass um, are consistent with our understanding of galaxy formation and how galaxies increase uh, mass through merging, in particular with the two phase formation scenario. And with this, I'll stop and I'd be happy to take any question. Ah, maybe I'll keep sharing for now. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. And we have one question from Kim V. And she asks, do you expect to see any difference in the star formation history for different orbital groups? groups? So you mean for um, cold, the cold component, hot component, and more component? Uh, yes, I do, because at least, well, that's what we'd like to see if there is, because from simulations, we know that there should be a difference. Uh, and so, yeah, the one component should be, well, the cold component is definitely coming from in situ star formation, while the hot component um, should be accreted. So the other thing that would be really nice to do, and there are other people working on this, is to, uh, so these are stellar kinematics, not gas, just stellar. Uh, but the other thing that it has been in, well, not, uh, yeah, kind of studied already, but it's a work in progress, is to color code these orbits by their metallicity and age so that you can actually characterize um, the stars, well, the simulated stars in the galaxy so that you can have that extra information uh, about, um, well, because we know that stars that are accreted have also different um, age from the stars that are in situ. So being able, or oh, well, same for the metallicity, so being able to actually see this color code in the orbits would be amazing. But it's, it's as I said, it's a work in progress and you need um, great special resolution to do that. And so probably that won't be possible um, with the semi-sample, but with other samples for sure. Um, yeah. And I think Amania raised her hand. Yes, Amania. Yeah, thanks, Julia. Really fantastic talk. Um, I have a little bit of a left field question, but I'm, your talk made me think about lenticular galaxies. Um, we're not really sure how they formed, but I guess there's two possible formation scenarios, and that's sort of like a faded disk scenario or also a merger driven scenario at higher redshift. So I was wondering if you could apply your technique on, uh, say, a sample of lenticular galaxies and be able to diagnose from the orbits whether or not you think they're um, merger fault driven or um, or just faded disks. Yeah, actually, that would be interesting to do. Yeah, um, well, usually you can't get like a you can get an indication from the orbits that we see because, of course, um, these are just models, so you don't you're trying to modeling what you see, but there are limitations because there's some degeneracy due to the inclination angle. So the more edge on the galaxy, uh, the better it is for us because the models work a lot better uh, with edge on galaxies. While if it's face on, it's still a little bit um, more complicated, but yes, there would be actually a good, I think a good idea to, to work on. Um, I don't know if you can say for sure distinguish for sure the two different formation scenario, but you could get could get an indication on whether the stars are coming from accretion um, events or not. Yes, I agree. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh. We have another hand raised from Li Song Yong. Hi, Julia. Uh... Very nice work, interesting. I My question is seems a bit naive, but I would like to ask this question. You mentioned that all these observational measurement is from a, the one effect radii. So do you think it's 
if it's necessary or even more beneficial if you can do this with a the larger scale let's say including you know two you know two or three or you know the five away the factory radii for example will that be a the give a the better constraints or do you expect that a sudden surprise if you start increasing the population from the larger scale that might have you know the different result so um, our galaxy, the, the properties that I derived are within one array, just because the measurements to so the observations that we had, um, some of them reach uh, radii that were higher than one array, but to get consistent results, since some of them didn't, we just um, focus on one array. But yes, I agree that having larger radii would be great. This is also because the evidence of litter accretion are usually, well, they're more evident if you go to uh, larger radii. So yes, having observations that reach larger radii would be amazing um, with the great, uh, with a good special resolution as well. Yeah. And I would expect to see some differences in there and it would be probably easier to check, for example, for the environmental analysis to check whether there are differences between, um, for example, center and satellite galaxies, since we can't really see that that much within one array. Yeah, thank you. Okay, is there any other questions for our speakers? No? Okay, then thank everyone. And yeah, this is the end of the talk. Thanks, everyone. and I thank our speakers as well.